morning. Um, after a decade of above global average African growth, um, we're still yet to see that kind of transformational growth which will really lower poverty and inequality across the continent. Um, the challenges facing the next generation of leaders will be to try and push through and deliver that kind of transformational growth. As we've already spoken about also, the working age population of Africa will continue rising until at least 2050. That means we're going to get more and more young people coming onto the job market. And another one of the challenges will be providing the jobs necessary um, to meet that demand. Um, in the labour market, and also, which Vera has right, um, well uh, pointed out, that um, governance uh, really does have to change. We do need that visionary governance. And it's very important that we're speaking in this forum about this um, to potential presidents and leaders in many, many different roles right here in this room. I'm sure many of you will take on um, amazing leadership positions. And we have a stellar panel here to discuss this with us. Um, so I'll just uh, speak a little bit about each of the panel members. So to my far, um, far left, we have Father Kuka. Um, father Kuka is a um, Catholic reverent um, father in Nigeria. He was the former um, Secretary General of the Catholic Secretariat. He is a scholar. He was recently here at St. Anthony's College, Oxford, and he's written um, and published a number of books looking at religion, um, uh, ethnicity, and civil society in Nigeria. He's a regular commentator, and we're very happy to have him on this panel with us. Can we welcome Father Kuka? We're also very pleased to have um, Kingwa Kamenku. Kingwa is running for the Kenyan presidential elections in March 2013. Um, she's currently studying here at Oxford. She's doing her second master's now here at Oxford in um, creative writing. She'll be done in September. And um, she, uh, was, she's always been very active in politics. She studied at the University of Nairobi, was very active politically there, and also here in Oxford. Kingwa, we're very um, happy to have you here. Thank you. And Hadil Ibrahim, um, sitting next to me. Um, Hadil, in 2006, was the founding executive director of the Mo Ibrahim Foundation, of which I'm sure you're all familiar, um, who promote good governance across the continent. Um, Hadil is a really inspiring activist. She's active in a number of different realms and on numerous boards with um, very pertinent issues that she's uh, campaigning for, such as women, um, young people, and art. Um, Hadil, we're very proud to have you here. Thank you very much. So for our time on this panel, I thought we'd um, split it up into three parts. Um, for the first part of this panel, I'll give each um, panel member a few minutes to describe the most important message that they want to give you today about the challenges and opportunities um, for youth leaders. Um, so after giving that message, then I'll have the second part, which will be me just asking some questions and following up on that. And then finally, uh, for the third part, we'll open it up to the floor and have a discussion with the, you, the audience. So um, to begin, it would be great if we could just have your thoughts. So I'll give you each about five minutes to describe um, the most important message that you really want to give today about what you think the challenges and opportunities are for the next generation of African leaders. So uh, we have a mic here. Hadil, do you want to sure. start? Thank you. Thank you, Emma. Um, I think the challenges and the opportunities uh, for the next generation of leaders are as follows. I'm, I'm really going to focus on two specific areas. One which is looking at the kind of uh, shared vision that Vera was talking about. And the other one really, looking at the issue of youth, um, it's clear that the greatest opportunity for the development of our continent lies in the massive potential of the continent. And when we talk about potential, we've traditionally talked about natural resources. To that, we now understand we need to add the human resource dimension. I'm sure Vera, I arrived a little bit late, so I, I don't want to repeat her, but when we look at the demographics of the continent in the context of global demographics, we see that Europe is an aging continent. It's a dying continent in every sense. China is an aging continent as well. We have to remember that. So when you look at Europe, we have more old people living much longer. 
And the implications of that is that it's much more expensive for the state to keep them alive. It's much more expensive to keep an 80-year-old alive than an 8-year-old. It's true, you need hip replacement, all these things. So <laughs> when you look at the, 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 this, then they all want pensions, the pension contributions that we need to make in order to keep them alive as well. We realize that you're going to need a very big labor base. You need a lot of working people to sustain that. That's true across Europe. That's true of China. So when we look at Africa, we look at, depending on which statistics you take, 50% are under 17 or 20 or 25. Or, it's a young continent. And all uh, the challenge for us is going to be taking this youth, this huge demographic bulge that we have, and translating that into wealth, translating that into opportunity. Because if we don't, we'll see what happened in North Africa, where that became uh, a source of unrest rather than a source of development. So understanding that great potential that could go either way. I'm going to talk about... Um, ensuring that we have the jobs. I think we have to go the other way around. We have to sit and identify what the labor market is going to look like in 10 or 20 years in Africa, and then we have to train people for that labor market. That is how we have to create an educational base. So if I give you an example, South Africa is probably the only country in the continent that's been properly geologically surveyed, where they know what's under the ground. So we're going to need a lot of geologists, okay? We know this. If we don't train them as Africans, if we don't train to be geologists, our governments, can, uh, our governments will be able to employ us to do these surveys. So what will happen? It will be Rio Tinto that does those surveys. And then who will own the geological data? It will not be us. So we won't even have access to the data about what we have under the ground. So we need to train geologists. Now, where is the, you know, I'm not a geologist, it's an example, but where's the geology training college? Do we have that? Are we being like China? Are we tra training 20,000 geologists a year, or 5,000 a year, or whatever it is to meet demand? And that's true across every sector. So we need to understand the domestic labor market. We also need to understand the global labor market. We need to understand the fact that Britain, America, do not train enough nurses and doctors. They rely on Africa to train them, and then they attract them. That's absolutely fine. That's how a global marketplace should work. But where the Malawian or the Tanzanian state is paying to train those doctors, they're effectively subsidizing the foreign health service. So we need, and I think the British are doing this already, we need to make sure that the sort of uh, host governments abroad are helping to fund those training colleges at source. So we don't get this strange kind of subsidy happening at the, educa at the tertiary educational level. So that's very loosely looking at how you can turn this youth bulge into a real asset. And then very briefly, I would just add, in terms of shared vision and in terms of being able to uh, negotiate, Africa suffers from being unable to negotiate coherently because Africa is 54 countries. Africa needs to become one market much more quickly than it's happening because 54 small, small economies are unable to compete one common Africa. Remember that Germany's GDP is two and a half times all of Africa's GDP. Two and a half times. France is about twice. And all these countries integrate, create one common market, one EU, one EU foreign policy. Africa, we have 54 China policies, 54 Turkey policies, 54 policies on Brazil. And then we wonder why they come with one policy and undercut us. So we have to be strategic, we have to sit down, we have to decide one common investment code for Africa. One common minimum wage that's adjusted locally. One common everything, so that when other people come into our continent and say, uh, we want to build a factory, <laughs> sorry, they'll build a factory on the basis of where is the best place to build a factory, not the government that's going to uh, bring down the minimum wage or give them a tax break, and effectively undercut each other to the bottom. So we need to create this sort of uh, continental orientation with continental unified policies, a unified market that can be competitive. And then within that, we need to uh, create, we need to understand what the labor opportunities are within that and train for it now. And then in 10 or 20 years, we might see the kind of uh, development that China has been able to manage because it's one market with a 20-year strategy rather than 54 markets with two, three, four-year electoral cycle strategies. So thank you. Thank you very much. My name is Kimba Kamenchu, and I just first want to start by saying that I, my heart, I feel so, like my heart is really warm at this moment to see this, to be here today and to just be in this presence. 
Um, I, was, I was part of the African Society Committee last year. I was present actually when they were growing up um, uh, uh, of the previous group. And that was the first time that we had the conference. And last year, the numbers were different from there till that last one. So just seeing how it's grown um, is really, it's really amazing. And just a very brief say, a uh, shout out to Idris and even all members of the committee. It's, it's been really great. Um, yes, yeah, so I was introduced as running to the president of Kenya, and yes, indeed I am. Um, one of our committee members that I worked with called Nelson Opong from Ghana, he joked and he said, Kingwa, you said being president of Africa was too small for you, so you decided to run to be president of Kenya. Um, but no, um, so I, I left Kenya in 2009 at the time, just about two years after we had a, a, bad, a bad election, the post-election crisis. 1,200 people died, more than half a million displaced. And while in, while in Oxford, with AFRISOC, like we always used to keep meet and keep talking about Africa, what is going on, what is happening at home. And I kept on asking who's doing, what is, who is killing the nation after that happened? What is being done to make sure that the wounds that, that really um, came up to the surface are not, are not um, um, are being healed, are being dressed, and something is being done about it. And I, I just did not see anything going on. What was happening was the same kind of negative politics. And I, I said that um, because I said that the next election is, is an opportunity to get involved. And I said that I, I'm not going to just keep on being on the outside and just pointing fingers and saying, all these people, all these people are doing this, this people are doing this. Um, you know, Gandhi says that we must become the change that we want to see. And so I said, you know what, I'm going to do this thing. It'll look crazy. People might say a lot of things, but. I would feel I've, I've, I've done my little part to try and do something. Um, so I, I made the announcement last September. Um, it was, that was such a huge funeral in Kenya. Like everyone was talking about this girl who's never coming up with theories. She went to UK. It was too cold. She grew crazy. <laughs> <laughs> she needs help. I mean, and others saying she's been sent by the French government. So there's been so many theories. But for me, it's just, I, I think, and I think it's a feeling that a lot of us as Africans in the diaspora have that. The distance really makes you feel that I want to do something about it. And then being in a place where you see that the conditions are much better, and every time you go home and you're always going like, why isn't, why, why are we having electricity relations right now, surely? What is, I mean, you're always asking why, why all this crime, why? And so I said, let me just try this, let me do what I can. And, and I don't know how to end up, but um, I will just try. And um, I think it was Thomas Sankara who said that. We need. Thank you, thank you, that's very kind. Thomas Sankara, uh, former Burkina Faso president, a man that I really respect and admire. I, think you, I, I did not encounter Thomas Sankara until I think I came to Oxford. And, I, I, and that's a man um, that I really look up to. He was president of Burkina Faso. He, in the 1980s, he was talking about how. African governments need to start, um, like, need to start being sufficient, being concerned. Like, he was the lone voice when all other, when a lot of African presidents were just very much used to the idea that we can only live on aid, we can only live as second class citizens. He was going out saying, you know what, you people, we have to be as first class citizens of the world. But anyway, he says that sometimes we need to do mad things. Sometimes we have to get out of the conventional way of thinking and just do mad things. And so for me, it's about, there's a way in which we have normalized the abnormal. We, we've made, it's, the, the conditions in Africa really are quite abnormal. They're not, they're not normal. The fact that um, the way people, like for example in Kenya, in the past few years, um, last year, this year, the famine in the northeastern part of the country, people dying, um, Somalia, you see what happens, northern Uganda, the DRC, and, and we take it, it's taken as abnormal. As, as a person in the Kenyan middle class, we say it as abnormal, but street children out there. But for, we, for me, it's that we need to, I got tired of normalizing abnormal, and I think that we need to really get out of that normalizing what is abnormal and doing something about it. Um, but uh, so just to say, in terms of challenges and opportunities, so the campaign has been. There was a lot of support from people in Kenya, like a lot of people were very affirmative, a lot of even, not just young people, but even older people, they came and said, King, 
you might know what you've done, you, 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 must, you made us feel that we, not, that we need to be ashamed of ourselves. Because you're, you're telling us, you're saying that you people have not, you people have, have not done this and you're not even feeling anything about it. And you small, young girl, don't even know what you're supposed to be, but you, you just have the will to do it. And so there's been a lot of support as well. Um, a lot of the times just sort of walking in the dark and we don't even know what we're doing. A lot of the time we don't have resources, up to 99% of the time we don't have resources yet. But it's, it's been such a, a, cha a challenge, a struggle, a journey. I look at it as an exploration. I don't find any chance think that I'm going to win um, the election in this coming, the next year. Um, but I think for me just being part of it is, is, is in the beginning and, and it's something that I'm willing to see through. So maybe just to say something very brief about, I don't know, I don't know what you A minute, please. One minute. minute yeah. Yeah. So in terms of challenges, um, number one, the state of our politics. I think this is something we can't ignore. The state of our politics, which is big money, corrupt, uh, which corruption is the way that you sort of like have to play the game. Um, ethnicized politics, because that's the kind of thing that we see. Um, and the values, what are the values that we have as a people? And because if, if we value life, and if we are really committed to life, then we will see that the priorities as a nation, as a government, uh, is will be making sure that every single person has food, every single person lives in a, in a, in a good place. Um, and so, so the second thing I'd say is like holding a vision, that's not for a challenge, holding a vision larger than life, cutting free from the idea that we as Africans are always going to be second class citizens in the world, that we're always going to be Jake. Um, and in, in terms of the vision, Kwame Kuma is someone that I really respect because he, he did not just look at himself as, as you know, this victimized Africa, but he saw himself as a citizen of the world, as somebody that, that in a sense, even beyond the Pan-African dream, he was looking at himself as, as a person that could even believe in the world. Because at some point he was actually, he actually, um, I think he sent food aid to China and he like, took part in like, um, trying to help some of the conflicts. And, and that's the way that we need to look at ourselves. Not, we're not victims. We have such a big contribution to be. Um, and so the last thing I'd say is delivery. You know, it's easy to talk. It's easy for me to, to say these leaders are not doing this, these leaders are not doing this. Talk is cheap. But if I ever get into government, we, and, and other young people, if we ever get into government, will we really be able to, to deliver? Um, and there's a lot of opportunities, the continent opening up. African people are very un anxious really about for, for improvements, for things to get better. And also we have the opportunity of time. We have the time to explore, the time to experiment. Um, Dr. Tamara, I, I like what Dr. Tamara said yes, he said that, that young people, they use, as young people, we are paid to dream. And I, I really like that because I probably wouldn't be doing this if I was 40 or 50, but now um, I have nothing to lose. And so, um, and so I think that's a, that's a thing that we young people need to, need to do. And we also need to realize that, you know what Franz cannot say, that every generation out of relative obscurity must discover its mission to feel to betray. And so it's for us to discover our mission, to, to see our mission. In the 1950s, it was the young people, the Maumau, the, 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 in Kenya, for example, the Majmaji in Tanzania, um, later on it was the ANC Youth League, and, and, and the, the, the young people in the forests in Zimbabwe. They were the ones, they fought to get independence, they, they lost life. And I even, I asked myself, they did so much, how do, do we really expect that our countries are going to get better when we just sit down and wait and sit down and look. So it's a challenge to all of us that to get out of our comfort zone, we have to be there, we have to do things that, that, that are really out of this world. And so for me, that's, that's just maybe the thing that I say. Thank you very much. Thank you. Right. 
money can be declared, whoever wins the next election will have defeated you. So that your name goes on the record. But um, <coughs> let me use the next few minutes to say my, my personal worry has about, let me say, what Nigeria in particular, where I come from. In the last uh, 10, 11 years since our country began the democracy, I have served in four presidential initiatives. And they all give me a slightly good picture of the problems with our country. And I think what you say about Nigeria, metaphorically, you can say about a lot of other African countries. I, and uh, people keep asking, why is Nigeria not working? It's a question I continue to ask myself. But this morning, I just uh, I emailed uh, it was a copy of the paper which I presented in, uh, in Nigeria uh, Thursday last week. The title of the paper is uh, Power Without Authority. <laughs> and I give the opportunity to look back at Nigeria because it's the one great country that uh, we've not been able to put the dots together as to why we are paid. And I'm not saying I found the answer, but the more I'm thinking about Nigeria, the more it has humbled me because I suddenly realized that we make quite a lot of mistakes. But it's the only country where our balance, and since independence, we have 14. We can't even, we don't get, there's no agreement on the nomenclature. President, head of state, head of imperial government, that's the beginning of our problem. Uh, that the conversation gets quite disrupted at the level of leadership. And then, so it on balance, you like, you know, 3.7 years pay if you decide to divide. Now, I don't think anybody running, even the smallest company, can hope to progress with that kind of leadership hemorrhage. So those things are consequences. The second point is that between 1922, when the British had an attempt at providing us with what we might you know, use to call the constitution, the 2012, we've had an average of about nine, ten constitutions. So the Nigeria constitution has every constitution that had a life span of nine point seven, ten ten years or whatever. No nation in history has this kind of So I, I made the point therefore that perhaps the first problem for us to address is how do we achieve enough stability to begin to conduct business in a particular kind of way? Everybody talks romantically about uh, Singapore, about Malaysia. And I don't know what part we want to take. Whether it's Singapore, when you were you being in power from 1959 to 1990, conducting and winning all these elections. <laughs> Mugabe has not done as much. Or whether it is in South Africa that a lot of Nigerian groups have diverted their resources to now. Which part of South Africa are we, are we happy about? Is it the one before or after apartheid? So clearly, like Africa is trying to do things that nobody in the world has done. Let me democratize, develop all at the same time. I think that the first thing to say is the process of recruitment. And you cannot participate in the game if you don't understand the rules. It is that clearly leadership in Africa will not have the opportunity of the two critical platforms we require for leadership recruitment. Ideology or history and political parties. Nigeria is, is, is again a wonderful country to look at, even in this regard. Because even within that volatility, every time you have an experimentation and a and it fails because it lives in Tabit. We never have one party continuing. Every time we start, we go back to forming different political parties. So you can't even identify, except saying there are a few puppet partners, like the kind of, there are all people who are, who, who are interested in politics, not because it is, it is for service, but there will be contractors today or politicians tomorrow, whatever helps them to access the, the, the resources of state. So I think that the first, I mean, among other things, it is important for us to understand that contrary to what a lot of us tend to think in Africa, that governance is about good men and good women. Uh, in Nigeria, we have the rather superfluous expression, we want good
Thank you very much to our panel members for that uh, very interesting beginning. 
Um, my, I'm, just going, I'm just going to have a couple of questions before we pass it on to the audience. Um, my first question is that uh, taking all of this into account, all of the um, changes, that, um, the challenges that um, Africa will face in the future, um, your experience as a presidential candidate, questioning why leaders have failed up till now, what should we, us here in this room, all of the potential very well educated, passionate young people um, here today, what should we be doing? Oh. That's, a, that's a huge question. Um, maybe um, I can speak to something that uh, the good bishop uh, just mentioned about this corruption uh, of leadership. Um, what's, you know, the, the challenge really is the fact that, that the average age of an African citizen is probably about 17. The average age of an African head of state is about 70. It's probably more dramatic than that. I guess the average age of an African is younger than this. So how can we as young people become involved in a serious way in the decision-making process and the prioritization process? Because it's clear that even the most enlightened of our senior leaders is unable to comprehend the challenges we have to face because they involve a 20-year time horizon. An 89-year-old head of state could not deal with what the climate change by 2050 is going to be because they're not going to be alive. And they know they're not going to be alive. And that's not a trivial point. Whereas one of you in this room, in dealing with issues of climate justice, issues of development, you know, for some of you, we're talking about things that will happen by the time you pay off your student loan. You know, you're, you're factoring in 20 years, 30 years. So I think one of the challenges, I certainly doesn't answer the whole question, but one of the challenges has to be making the case for youth engagement now, making the case for why we as young people can be involved in the decision-making process at the local level. There's nothing, I mean, in Sierra Leone, every decentralization committee has to have a young person on it. Every decentralization committee has a young person. So there's nothing to stop anyone in this room being a local you know, involved at some stage in local government and holding government accountable. But beyond that, how do we get involved in the decision-making process? How do we get involved in setting priorities and making it clear that government, governments should not be ruling for the electorate, they should be ruling on behalf of the electorate's children? That, that is something that can only be articulated by young people. and, and it's not what, it's not a prescription, but it's a challenge to people in this room. You have to prove your worth to your elders. And in Africa, that's a challenge. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Should we just pass it down? Thanks. Thank you. Um, I think that what we should be doing is this kind of thing. Um, and, and it's something that I, know, I think we should not take lightly at all. Because um, when we look back to history, the discussion on independence started after like the nineteen was it the nineteen forty five the Manchester Conference um, on Pan Africanism uh, and then I mean all those all those discussions bringing the African Americans together, bringing um, African students in London, UK together. And that's it was that that then led to Kwame Nkrumah meeting Nyerere meeting Kenyatta and all, all of them say, you know what, this is not right, let's do something about it. And so this kind of thing is very, very potentially very powerful. Uh, uh, so the other, the other thing is that because I am certain that we will not get the solutions if we keep on just doing things the usual way, business as usual. So forums such as these are important for thinking through what's going on, critiquing trying to identify what is the problem, what is the solution, how do we find it? Um, because it's, it's sort of like an intellectual, um, this is an almost like an intellectual group, students facing out for students from other colleges, universities. And so while we are not back home and while not everyone is going to get into politics, this, this is still a very important contribution we can make from places such as these. Um, and I mean, what, what uh, the late Tim was very strong to talk about defining the vision, redefining the vision. That's something very important. That's something that we can be doing. And I think from discussions such as this, um, we could. At some point, I got tired of so many of conferencing talk, because I used to critique them. We're just doing talk talks, we're just doing. But I think it is important. It's important that.
that we go on having this kind of discussion. I do very much think so. You know, in my line of business as a priest, I get to see a lot of young people. And, uh, every time in my office, in my, even now, I have, I have, I have less than 50 CDs of young people who are looking for jobs. And I decided to pay a lot of attention to them. But there was one particular young man who, it's about 10, 15 years ago, he walked into my office and he said, Look, I'm looking for a job. And I looked at the advert for the job he applied for. And they'll tell you in Nigeria, even if you're looking for a job as a driver, so you need a bit more of 10, 15, or 20 years experience. <laughs> and so, so the young man said, I said, I said, when you see the job you are applying for, they said, they need 10 years experience. He said, but father, how will I get the experience? He said, but I have experience. And I said, no, okay, what kind of experience? They said, I have more than 15 years experience of suffering. <laughs> this is what you that matter. And you kind of joke about it, but I think it was a very important point to make. I think what we are really confusing. In Africa, we are confusing two very, very fundamental issues. We are confusing office holding with leadership. And in the paper I spoke about, which I hope if you have a website, probably you there, I made the point. It is possible to be in power and not be in office. It is possible to be in office and not be in power. And a lot of African heads of state are, they are in office but not in power, because power is also about legitimacy. So, but I also think that because there can only be one president at the same time, we should not spend a lot of our time, and I think this is the temptation. Many of us are spending a lot of time thinking of elected office or seeking political appointments. But if you look a little bit more clearly, you will discover the candidates of this world, the mother Teresa of this world, all kinds of other people to exercise leadership without necessarily holding office. So I think it's really a function of how do we not necessarily by the sheer fact of no matter how do we make a difference in our little local environment? Because, as I said, we may not be the Mazuka person of this world, we may not be the, you know, but clearly, and like I said to young people who are who do national service in Nigeria, they come to my office, they say, look, please, especially the young people, especially the women, and I mean, with, with all respect, but the young girls tend to come to my office and say, please help me, you know, I want them to send me to a bank. He said, I don't want hardship possible. That's what they call it in the youth service. And when and they want to work in a bank, and I keep saying, no, you know, if you go and serve somewhere, even if all you do is to teach two or three or four old women or old men how to write their names, it will be important. So I think really it's a question of how do we measure, and I think the deputy prime minister, when he comes to talk, I'm happy that, as I say, we are all, you know, yapping away before he finally appears. <laughs> and, you know, I think I was saying that she was happy she spoke before him, but I felt like, you know, I just defeated Brazil and then now I have to face Spain. <laughs> <laughs> but I think you will hear from him, you know, so bit of experience. But I think the, the most important point I want to make is let's, especially as young people, let's begin to think a little bit more clearly and creatively about how we can make impact. The final point, and I think that this speaks to you, it's like, okay, if you live in a country like Nigeria, and again in the paper I talk about, all our heads of state and president, all of them, have come to office purely by accident. From the beginning of our independence, when you read the paper, you see, it doesn't, I mean, a lot of people who had this job, they are shocked. And I said, yes, that's the truth. There isn't a single Nigerian president or head of state who actually sat down in Oxford when they never came to lose bed. First of all, <laughs> the sad thing about all this is that with all the educated people in Nigeria, it's only in the last four years or three years that we've had a president who went to university. Well, we're all worrying about that. Now put up on with the doctorate degree. It hasn't been a great improvement on this situation. But it is that even how the kind of things we learn, because many of us living outside here, which is where the promise is, are also culturally, we have cultural problems. We may be Hebrews, but we don't speak Hebrews. All right, we'll be here, but we'll not speak here. And how are you going to govern a country and how we should know almost next to nothing? So I think these are some of the issues. And as, you know, from listening to you, it seems that you've paid a lot of attention. But while you are waiting to leave, it will be very helpful for you to familiarize yourself with your culture, with your history, and how. Because I said to people, when of us and you became president, being a Yoruba man, Almost every Nigerian, almost every thing has been going to call him Baba, but Nigerians then as now still called him Baba. And I'm sure that he's older than, than, uh, than the passenger. 
But uh, had he been president, and even if he was still president, Nigerians would not call him Baba. They would probably, you know, we call him a like Jewish and that he would be one that happened with that. So I think those, those are some of the issues. And finally, I mean, let me just give you a message for your dad, please. <laughs> I, I've been trying to meet him after that. I've been trying to meet him after that. I've been trying to meet him after that. But let me give you a message for him. You know, I was at the Kennedy School with Rodberg, working on me. On Metrics, the same as you But you know, my worry is why would you commit $5 million to a leader in a continent where you know that even the cleanest of them have more than $10 million in the bank? And given the, 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 the fact that many of them are president and by the time they retire, they are 70, 80, what are they going to do with all that? I would suggest, and I think that it might actually be more important, because if you commit $1 million to young people like her and all these other people, so I think it's more important because I'm looking at the CV of many young people here, and I know that $5 million spread across women, women leaders, young leaders, all kinds of other people who are doing different things in Africa, it is far more rewarding than committing it to the situation in which we are just looking for the best among the groups because that's what <laughs> <laughs> Can I take the mic?